so let's get started. Today we're doing the first law of thermodynamics since last time we did the, the, the zeroth law. Yeah. And so this thing's not been behaving. I need to try to get new batteries. I need to write myself a note for that too. So here's the first law of thermodynamics, and this is the simplest or most concise way I've ever seen it stated. The internal energy of an isolated system is constant. <laughs> So a lot of times you hear people say, oh, it's the law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. That's another way to say it, okay? But this is a little more technical, and we'll talk about what an isolated system is here in a second. And the internal energy, we know that that's directly related to the population of those quantized energy states, so the molecules and their quantum states. And so that energy would be constant in an isolated system. And from this flows all of these other terms that we'll talk about today. So we've already discussed internal energy, but today we get into the difference between heat and work. So three cheers for that. We'll look at enthalpy, which is again a measure of heat, constant pressure. And then uh, we'll introduce uh, Hess's law, which is the basis of what you've already used. And that is the delta H of formations and coming up with delta, delta H of reactions. Uh, we'll look at heat capacity and then state functions in thermodynamic terms. And so let's uh, dive into uh, some of these definitions. So when we talk about an isolated system, this is very important to understand the difference between an isolated, a closed, and an open system. Okay. And so an open system, matter can leave and energy can leave. So our beakers in the lab, or those are open systems. And we talk about not heating a closed system. So a closed system would be something where matter can't exit. Energy can go in and out, okay, and when you're heating a closed system, energy is going in, but the matter can't leave, and so you build up pressure, and that's a dangerous situation in glassware. So uh, I remember my freshman year, we were doing uh, a synthesis. We had an interesting class. You had the regular freshman sections, and then at UT we had a section for chemistry majors, and so this was a lab section. We were actually doing some fantastic synthesis. We synthesized this organometallic compound and um, made this beautiful robin's egg blue solution and crystals and so on. Well, the person next to me was heating a closed system. They had plugged everything up and we had a three neck flask and a condenser and we were refluxing and so on. And I leaned down to look at the thermometer or do something and a little stopcock thing blew out of their three neck flask and was right where my head would have been if I hadn't leaned down and I flew over my head. Oh. <laughs> and I said, wow. <laughs> and the person said, what happened? I said, you were heating a closed system. You know, something's going to give. And I'm glad that the stopcock gave and not the glassware. Yeah, so that was pretty exciting. And then, uh, so that's a closed system. Now, an isolated system is a matter and energy are both contained. They can't leave. So that would be an insulated, sealed container. And so if it's isolated, you can't really communicate it with it. I mean, energy in and out is the way we communicate with systems. We, we put energy in to affect them, or we measure the energy leaving them to measure their, thermo their, uh, their um, temperature and those kinds of things. A close example for isolated would be like a bomb calorimeter? Yes, and so we have that. We have it sealed up so that matter can't leave. And then we have the, it's interesting, we, it's how you define the system. So the calorimeter itself is the isolated system because we have insulation around there. And then inside, which we'll talk about a calorimeter today, we have the, the liquid around the bomb. And so the, the energy generated by the bomb goes into the liquid and we measure the temperature change of the liquid. So that's, uh, that's the, the schematic. And so one thing that's important to think about is the signs on this energy. So we describe the system, and we, that's probably the most important thing to do in a thermodynamic system, a thermodynamic uh, arrangement is, to, is your definition of the system. And so whenever there's a, a negative sign, then that means that heat has flowed out of the system, or energy has flowed out of the system in terms of joules, of, of heat. So this negative sign indicates heat lost to the surrounding. So this is the, the important part here. <clears throat> okay. 
And so if we have our hand over a boiling pot and that steam condenses on our hand and it burns our hand, what's happened? Like in this particular case, uh, uh, the steam has condensed on our hand. So when we talk about the steam, that's an indication that that's the system. Okay. And our hand is the surroundings. And so when it condenses, the heat lost from the steam goes into the surroundings, which is our hand. And so the sign of heat for the steam, the system, is negative. Heat flowed out. The sign for our hand would be positive. Okay, so it would flow into our hand. hand. The hand has gone up in energy, and the steam has gone down in energy. So this is probably the, the, the most confusing part, even though it shouldn't be. But following that negative sign is, is the trick to thermodynamic understanding. So trying to decide what the system is and whether energy decreased or increased. <clears throat> And so whenever we say that the surroundings um, is equal to minus system, so when I said our, the, the heat for our hand would be positive sign and the heat from the steam is a negative sign, a lot of times when we see this right here, you'll see this written. It's another statement of the first law saying that, that uh, heat is neither, or energy is neither lost nor created, okay? We're saying that if the if heat comes out of the system, it goes into the surroundings. A lot of times we think that this negative sign is the same as that negative sign, and it's not. This whole thing is Q system. And that whole thing has a negative sign inside it. See this right here? So that the Q surroundings is positive. Follow me? Yeah, so that's, that, that's where that negative sign goes when we talk about the surroundings. We change that negative sign to a positive and it becomes positive joules into the surroundings. So that when I said that's the place where most people make mistakes, it's just not keeping track of those negative signs. And we'll have a very simple exercise that we do in the uh, non-majors class, we do it in the freshman class, we'll do it again in PCHEM, and that is just mixing hot and cold water trying to predict what temperature the final result's going to be and keeping track of where all your jewels went, okay? And so we'll become better accountants this semester in tracking our jewels because it's really just accounting. He flew out, flowed out of the water and into the styrofoam cup. He flowed out of the water and into steam as it left the container and into the thermometer and so on. So we'll keep track of all of our different jewels. Okay. And so basically this, this statement that internal energy of an isolated system is constant or the other ways to say this is energy is neither created nor destroyed. Now, um, <laughs> they've added this term mass energy instead of just mass is neither created nor destroyed and energy is neither created nor destroyed because mass and energy can be converted into each other using Einstein's equation. Now you'll hear uh, people say another statement of the first law that the mass energy of the universe is constant. So they kind of combine those two words to say mass, energy, because mass can turn into energy and I guess vice versa. Okay. And why do they say the universe? Well, if you think about the universe, it's an isolated system. We don't know that there's anything beyond our universe, but at this point we think that the Big Bang happened and it expanded and then it's now continuing to expand and that there's, a, I guess, a frontier somewhere uh, but we have no idea if it's open or closed, so the assumption is that, it are, that it's isolated, that there's no energy leaving our universe, nor is it, um, um, you know, it's expanding. I don't exactly know, and it's, it's unknown. Like, space itself is expanding, which blows my mind. It's not expanding into an existing space. Like, if you blow up a balloon in this room, the balloon is expanding into an existing space. There's a coordinate where it's not and a coordinate where it is. But our current model of the universe is that there's nothing outside our universe and that space itself is expanding. It's just getting bigger, but getting bigger into what? That's the thing that we can't get our minds around. So, yeah, if, if you, that confused you, it confuses everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat> 
So let's define things. We really don't have a good definition of what energy is. Like ontologically, what is energy? We really don't know. It just is. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a system's capacity to do work. That's probably the best explanation that we have. So if you're at a higher energy, you have the more, more capacity to do work. And if you cool down, you've lost some capacity to do work. And it's really easy to think in terms of gases, right? You have gases in a container at a high temperature, there's a high pressure. And they can push a piston. If you lose temperature or lose pressure, you've lost energy. And you can't push the, push the piston as hard or as many times. And so that we can track that with a gas very easily using an ideal gas law. And we can see what, which gas and which situation has more capacity to do work, and we call that energy. And we track it with joules. And even at, the, um, at your power meter on the back of your apartment or house, you know, it's charging you kilowatt hours. Well, a watt is a joule per second, and it's multiplying by time. How many watts times however long you've had it going, and so essentially you're buying joules. The time pieces have canceled. Watts times time gives you joules. And so you're buying and selling joules. The, the electric company is uh, selling you joules and you're buying joules. So we're buying capacity to do work. And so our system gains energy when work is done on it. So if you wind a spring or compress a gas, you're putting energy into the system. When you heat something up, you're putting energy into the system. You're increasing its capacity to do work. So there's a this, this just constant exchange of energy. And then the system loses energy when it does work. So when the spring unwinds, like we used to have watches that worked on springs. Okay, when that spring unwinds and turns the hands on the clock, you know, it's, it's winding down. It's losing the capacity to do work. It will eventually run out. Or when a compressed gas pushes a piston, it's, it's dropped in temperature, dropped in pressure, but it's got a larger volume, so it's used up some energy pushing back against a force. And that energy has gone out of the system in the terms of work. And so we're talking a little bit buried in here is, is some concepts of work and heat. And so this is the way that, that a system can gain or lose energy. And most of the time, we use heat to increase the energy of the system so that the system can do work for us. So we put heat in and we get work out. And that's how heat engines work. So this whole section right here of the course is uh, sort of macro thermodynamics, but it's also the whole thing based on motors and engines. So this section, if you looked at the little graphical syllabus, we climbed these little mountains. The first one was the statistical thermodynamics mountain. And standing on top of that mountain, we could look back and see quantum mechanics. And looking forward, we could see thermodynamics and equilibrium and spontaneity, exothermic, you know, things like that. And so then we now went through the valley uh, of the exam. <laughs> and we're climbing this next hill. This next hill, when we get to the top, we'll be able to look at all the engines that drive our, our automobiles, that um, generate our power, that uh, air condition and heat our homes. So this bulk thermodynamics and talking about heat and work really helps us understand how we use thermodynamics every day in, in transportation and then heating and air conditioning. So work is this fundamental property in thermodynamics. It's measurable. That's the main point, that we can actually see non-random motion and that's one way to describe it. If it's, uh, if it's heat escaping the system, it's random motion. Most of the time, it's just cr increasing the, tr the uh, velocity of air around it, like your computer is air-cooled. And so out the back, you have a higher kinetic energy of those gases than being sucked into the front. You know, the fan is pulling those gaseous molecules by the CPU, and, and it's taking heat away in the form of random motion. So it's increasing the kinetic energy of the air. But work uh, would be like pushing a piston. So the piston's going in a, in a single direction. And because you can see that non-random motion, you know it's work. So lifting a weight, that's, that's non-random. That's, that's definitely work. 
And so raising a weight, expanding a gas against an external pressure, even driving an electrical current through a resistance, making those electrons go through the wire past a resistance, um, that's also work, and it's very measurable. And so the surroundings decide whether it's heat or work. So energy is leaving the system in both of these cases. So in both cases, the system is losing energy to the surroundings. But it could go into random motion, meaning heat. It's just heating up the surroundings. Or it can go into ordered motion, where the surroundings are moving in a particular direction. And most of the time, that's expansion of a gas or expansion of moving a piston, moving the wall of a container, which a piston is just a movable wall. You just push on it and it moves. And you put something on the other side that you want to, to turn that motion into rotary motion or you know, linear motion. You can choose. So ordered motion equals work and random motion equals heat. Okay. And so let's look at some of the math behind it. So this, this uh, change in internal energy total uh, really only has two options. It's either the system or the surroundings. You know, and both both of them can change. But but remember, our, our first law said that the uh, the change in total internal energy is zero. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's where we end up with that um, that the system is equal to the minus delta u for the surroundings. And so one of those numbers is negative. So if the system loses energy, it's negative, and then the the delta U of the surroundings is positive, and so this negative sign makes up the difference. So like if I had minus, uh, let's just say six joules here, then this minus sign, we're gonna put it here, this would be a positive six joules. So the delta U for the system, if it was negative, then the delta U for the surroundings is positive. And how do I get a negative number to equal a positive number? I've got to add in another minus sign. So that's what's going on with that. And you could just as well have changed this one to a negative, but you'd have to change that one to a positive. Okay. So they're always equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. If it leaves the system, it goes into the surroundings, or vice versa. So this is without electrical, chemical, or phase changes. There are only heat and expansion work. So a lot of times we lock it down. We're just going to say we're expanding a gas or compressing a gas. We're not worrying about electrical work. Uh, we're not seeing chemical reactions or phase changes. We'll get into those things later, but let's simplify things right now and just talk about expansion work. And for expansion work, it's pretty, pretty simple. So... This is the key equation for this portion of the course, that the energy, the change in, in the system is the heat plus the work. <clears throat> Sometimes there's defined situations where the work has to be zero. So like if we're only dealing with expansion and compression work and we put it in a fixed container, then you can't do any work because the volume can't change. You can't expand or contract, you can't do any work that's the only work you're considering, then work has to be zero. So any internal energy change has to come in the form of heat. So I could change the energy of the system by heating the system up, but it's not expanding. So I've set work to zero, added in some Q, put in some heat, and I'm changing the internal energy of the system by heating it up. Other times we put it in an insulating container where heat cannot go in and out through the walls. And so the only internal energy change we have in that situation is the work. It could expand or contract, but it can't have any heat flow. That happens sometimes when the process is really fast. So it expands really fast. There's no time for heat to change. And so you have just a, what we call an adiabatic expansion. So that's a new vocabulary word that we'll have. Uh, one thing, too, I'd like to apologize for, and that is that I didn't write these variables we have Q, and in this particular part of the course, Q is heat. And on the last mountain trip, <laughs> Q was the partition function. They're not at all related to each other. Okay, so you get it's context, and I'm sorry, but there's no way around it. If I start changing the letters and start making 
Q, little h or whatever, I'd be the only one that taught it that way. And if you saw equations in the book and so on, you would be totally confused. So this is traditionally Q is used for, for heat. Uh, and in the stat mech, Q is used for the partition function. And we just got to be, a, you know, grown-ups and realize that context is key. <laughs> so, okay, so then uh, this internal energy um, is really just, again, like I said, the, the, the energy of all of those energy levels so the kinetic energy, uh, the rotational energy, the translational energy, vibrational energy, uh, those all add together to give you that internal energy. It's a state function too. We didn't really talk much about the st this idea of a state function, but um, the word helps. So think about an energy state. So if I'm standing on the second floor, I think just in terms of my potential energy, Standing on the second floor, I have quite a bit of potential energy because I weigh quite a bit and gravity's pulling on me and I'm not at the ground level, <laughs> okay? Now, that's my energy state and it doesn't matter how it was prepared. So I have the same energy on the second floor regardless of whether I came from the first floor or whether I came from the third floor. So it just depends upon where you are in terms of your state variables and in terms of gravity and and so on my state variable is my mass and my elevation that's all and so in thermodynamics we have state variables that depend upon the various what we call equation of state variables and you already know an equation of state pv equals nrt so the ideal gas law tells you all of the state variables you need to know okay pressure temperature volume and number of particles once you know those four things, then you can describe the state of the system. And now you might not be able to get an absolute energy for that, uh, although the absolute temperature gives you some idea. Um, but you can certainly do energy changes. So if you, have a, if you start with an initial point of N, P, V, and T, and then you go to some other point, like you expand the system, volumes change, temperatures change, number of moles of gas probably hasn't changed. Pressure may have changed. Uh, you, can change, you can see the change in energy based upon those state variables. So internal energy is a, a, a state function. And if you have the, the equation of state and the state variables, then you can know the energy of the system. And so heat and work can change this energy. And because it's a state function, you can just take the final state minus the initial state. And so that's a it's very... That's very good. So uh, in terms of the change in energy, you can just look. Final energy minus the initial energy, you know the delta U. Another way to say it is, is that it's not path dependent. The internal energy is not path dependent. What is confusing is that heat and work are path dependent. So notice the delta U is also equal to the heat plus the work. And the best way to describe this is going from the first floor to the second floor, I can take my energy of the second floor and I can subtract the energy I had at the first floor and I could get my delta U. But Walking up the stairs versus taking the elevator is two different paths. And one of those generates more heat than the other. One of those is more work than the other. And so whether I have a, a different path will tell me if I have more heat versus more work. You follow me there? So the heat and work absolutely depend upon the path. But the endpoints do not. So how I get to the second floor, uh, you know, if I go up the stairs, it's, it's going to require more exertion and so on. And, and there'll be more, I'd say, heat in my face, right, <laughs> walking up the stairs versus uh, in the elevator, it kind of breaks down a little bit because I'm getting a machine to do the work for me. So it, it, it is a little bit confusing there. But I'm just saying that, that you will have a different value for for heat and a different value for work if you have a different path. 
but that sum will give you the same number. If I'm going from the first floor to the second floor, the sum of heat and work will add up to that difference. Okay, and some paths will have zero heat and all work, and other paths will have zero work and all heat, and other paths will have a combination of the two. But the endpoints are the same. You see what I mean? It's like another analogy that I've used that may have helped some students, and that is, um, the, let's use a monetary one. So I'm looking at my um, bank account, I'm re reconciling, I don't know, do y'all still do that? Look, if you wrote checks or use your debit card. Um, and so I've gone down a hundred bucks. It could be all checks, it could be all debit cards, or it could be some combination of the two. And so heat and work are check and debit card. So I can have a different ratio of, of debit card and, and check transactions, but the difference is still a hundred dollars. Okay. And what we want to do in terms of our usefulness is we want to maximize work because we're, that's efficient. So if we got a certain energy change, we want work to be the biggest part of that sum. And that's what we're getting. When, when we try to make our cars go further, get more miles per gallon and so on, we're playing this game. We want W to be big and we want Q to be small. So that's, uh, that's, that's the game, is try to get more work out of the system. And you'll be sad, that's one thing about this course, you'll be sad to realize that heat engines uh, have some natural limits as to what they can do in terms of the amount of work we can get out of them. You know, you would think that 33% that was bad. That's about the maximum <laughs> in, in many cases, in many realistic cases. 33% is a really great efficiency. <laughs> it's sad, you know, and so we're, there's, there's a lot of um, work to be done, but some of these are, are just thermodynamic limits. We, it's not because we're not smart enough. There's just some natural limits to what we can do in terms of efficiencies. So let's get into the specifics of pushing a piston. So this, uh, we have the system defined, say in the bottom part of this container, and that piston, that little movable wall, is a weight. And so if this expands, it's pushing against that external pressure. And so we have the external pressure of one atmosphere. Let's say the piston is weightless, and we just have one atmosphere pushing on this little membrane. And our system expands, and it pushes against a constant pressure of one atmosphere. Okay. And so when that piston moves, it sweeps through a certain volume. And so then this force is equal to that area and the maximum pressure on the back, or the, or the external pressure on the back. So that's the force that it's pushing against. And so that's why we designate this uh, displacement as the displacement volume of our, uh, of our engines, is it's how much the gas is expanding. In fact, we uh, use, and we'll get in again later in this section of the course, the other terms that we use for our automobiles. We have cubic centimeters or cubic inches or liters of displacement. You've seen like a five liter engine or a three liter engine. And then there's also compression ratio. So what percentage of the volume is changing? And so this is what we call a, an indicator diagram. And it's isobaric because it's a constant external pressure. So this is a PV diagram on the, anytime we get a diagram in this course, especially this next two sections, this one and the next one, always look at the axes first. And if they're not labeled, fuss at me. <laughs> okay, because I'll fuss at you if you put a diagram down and they're not labeled. So go to the axes first. Vertical axis in this one is pressure and the horizontal axis is volume. And so initial and final, on the left is the initial, on the right is the final because we're doing expansion. And so if, the, if it's swapped, then you're doing compression. So the final and initial is really important. It tells you the difference between compression and expansion. So in this case, we have initial on the left, final on the right. So by definition, the volume's getting bigger. Okay, so that's expansion. And we know it's isobaric because there's a horizontal line across the top. It's an external pressure, and it's the same through the whole thing. You see that? So we kind of describe the setup. We've got an isobar across the top, 
new vocabulary word for you. Isobar means same pressure. So that line across the top is an isobar. And then we're expanding. And this area is that pressure external times the delta V. So V final minus V initial. So that's our change in volume. And so the system is pushing that piston against a constant external pressure. This is called an indicator diagram over here on the right. And it kind of is analogous to this thing below where we've got the volume in a small space and now the volume is in a big space. So we see the expansion and you see the piston being moved. Okay. And so this is that work for, for uh, you know, isobaric volumetric expansion. So this is the amount of work generated by this piston. And so let me walk through this. You see the pressure times delta V, so pressure times V final minus V initial, and that's going to be joules, and we'll figure out how to get joules out of this. And then that minus sign in front of the P external makes the work term negative, because we're looking at this from the, the aspect of the system. And so if the system does work on the surroundings, it it's, needs to be negative, because that energy now has, its a capacity to do work has decreased. It's done some work, and now it can, we need to indicate that that has a negative uh, sign on it so that it's showing that the energy, the joules, has flowed out of the system in the form of work. Now, what's interesting is this V final minus V initial, you've got to pay attention here to the signs on these. I'm going to draw my little glasses. Okay, so those are my glasses. I'm saying pay attention to V final and V initial. Because if this were compression, V final would be a smaller number than V initial. And so this difference would be negative. A lot of students try to do just, it's just a, a mess up. They do big minus small, not final minus initial. So final and initial are really important. If it's compression, your final number is smaller than your initial number, and this is going to be a negative difference. You're going to have a small number minus a big number, so your number is going to be negative, and that's going to cancel that negative sign out front and give you a positive value for work. Positive value for work means the system gained energy, and that's what happens in compression. If I compress a gas, I put energy into that gas, and so I need a positive number on my joules, I need a positive sign. And that positive sign comes from the V final being smaller than the V initial. So that's a, that's a common pitfall. And I know because I fell into it when I was a student. You know, I was like, where are my, where are my negative signs going? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always off. And I realized just I was making life simple. I've got two numbers. I know the smaller number subtracting the bigger number. But I didn't like that. And so I would, I would take the big number and subtract the small number and I'd have a positive difference, and that's, that's ruining the problem. You actually need a negative difference when you're, when you're doing compression, and then it cancels that negative sign, and you get a positive work term. Okay. So then uh, there's other ways to do expansion and compression. You know, this uh, isobaric system, maybe, maybe it's not an isobar, maybe it's not a per constant external pressure. You know, pressure is a function of volume. You've got the ideal gas law up here. PV equals NRT. Well, if I just solve for pressure, that volume shows up over here in the denominator. And so this is, uh, this is the ideal gas law, that, that, um, that isotherm. So we pick a particular temperature and we see that as the pressure, or as the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And work is related to this area under the curve. So we had quite a bit of work from, from our constant expansion, but now we can get a little bit more work out of it, right? We can get that triangle. And if we can get that triangle, we get more work. So sometimes we want to try to get that, that triangle. And so this is uh, what we would call it reversible expansion. So this is a more controlled expansion. As it's expanding, uh, it tends to want to cool, and so we're putting heat into the system to 
keep it isothermal. And so we get more work out of a reversible process, especially a reversible isothermal expansion. We get more work out of that. And so sometimes that's what we want to do. This is a little bit more difficult to come up for this. Um, a lot of times, because we want to control that system, these are by nature slower. Okay. And so let's look at this. Let's take the derivative of work with respect to, um, to volume. And so the change in work, again, this is going to be those little infinitesimal changes. We want to integrate this area underneath. And so, so here we have our integral with respect to volume, and we have the pressure change, and we're going to substitute that with the ideal gas law. So this piece right here is the pressure. And now this isn't bad because we just have the integral of dV over V. And these other things are constants. They come out front. And so that's one of my integrals I remember from calculus. And so remember dx over x, that's natural log. And so this is now the work equation for reversible isothermal expansion. And it's very important that you see v final is on top and v initial is on bottom. You know, when we did the integral, we had the... Um, evaluated at final minus the, the initial term because those are the limits of integration and whenever you have the natural log and there's a subtraction that's the same as the natural log of the of the ratio yeah so that just tells you where the ratio came from v final on top v initial on bottom so when v final is uh is higher than v initial you have the natural log of a number that's greater than one and so that's positive and so then we still have the negative sign to make work negative so for expansion, we end up with negative joules. But if V final is smaller than V initial, then we have the natural log of something less than one. And that's going to be negative. So the natural log of, of numbers less than one is negative. And so then that sign cancels, and we get a positive value for work. Because for compression, we did work on the system. Okay. So we're already, just with work and gases, we have two equations. We have the constant external pressure times the change of volume, and then we have the reversible isothermal expansion. And so here's some practice. Um, let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's just do this one. This has got a tricky question. I've got one minute. So um, this first one is a trick, but it's a common trick. The expansion work when 55 grams of iron reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas in a closed vessel of fixed volume. How much expansion work can you do in this system? Zero. And so for A, W is equal to zero. Piece of cake. Okay. Now the second one, I conveniently picked 55.8 grams of iron because that's one mole. Okay. So we have so solid and aqueous producing aqueous and gas. So I have one mole of iron producing one mole of gas. And so this is my system. How much expansion work is it going to do? It's, it's one mole of gas pushing back the atmosphere. Now, when I say that it's a, uh, I'm out of time, but uh, we could put this in a piston and push it back, but a lot of times we don't. But it's still doing work. If it's pushing the atmosphere back, that's non-random motion. The atmosphere is going back. And so it's doing work by pushing the atmosphere back. Okay. And, and so we have uh, one atmosphere of pressure, and we generate one mole of gas um, at 300 Kelvin. And so we could find out the, the volume change for one mole of gas times 300 Kelvin times R over one atmosphere. And so we would have our delta V. That's how much the volume changed, essentially one mole. So um, it's like 24 liters or so. And so we have then, well, we'll just start here. We'll just start here next time and do this problem because we're out of time and we're going to I'll talk too long.